Well, hopefully you've had a chance to find your spot there in Joshua chapter number three. Joshua chapter number three. And let's uh, stand together for the scripture reading tonight. I don't think we'll be long. Joshua chapter three, verse one says, And Joshua arose early in the morning. How many early risers do we have in here? I know Brother Furso is an early riser. I can show you the text on my phone he sent me just about a week ago. It was at 4.30 a.m. And he said, hey, LC, you up? <laughs> it was on my day off. So I told Brother Furso the next day, I said, hey, just for the record, I'm never up at 4.30. I'm never, you don't even have to ask. I'm never up at 4.30. I don't, I, to this day, Ashley said, well, what did he need? I'm like, I don't care. It was 4.30 in the morning. <laughs> I don't care what he needs. Uh, so I, I still to this day, I need to ask him what that was all about. But, but Joshua rose up early in the morning and they removed from Shittim and came to Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they passed. And it came to pass after three days that the officers went through the host and they commanded the people saying, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the priests, the, and the, the, priests, the Levites bearing it, you shall remove from your place and go after it. And there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Come not near unto it, that ye may know the way by which ye must go. For ye have not passed this way heretofore. And Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much again for your word and this, the opportunity that we have tonight to come and to gather and to hear from you. And God, I, I pray that you would show us things from Scripture tonight that would challenge us and convict us and, and change us, Lord. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. There was an article I came across this past year entitled, The Things Our Bosses Said A Lot Last Year. The Things Our Bosses Said. It was a New York Times article. And there's a firm called Sentio. And Sentio is a research phone. And they track over 20,000 corporate phone calls. So between CEOs and investors, this firm tracks these phone calls and really tracks actually even the verbiage that is used during these phone calls. Well, as you can imagine, uh, the phone calls between CEOs and investors last year were quite different than other years. Uh, one of the phrases that was used uh, quite frequently was the phrase, you're on mute. You're on mute. It, was, it had an increase of 1,000% year over year. Technical difficulties was a phrase that was tracked over 300 more percent of year over year. Work from home was also uh, used more often. The new normal. How many of you guys have heard that phrase? The new normal. Up 500%. Stimulus, uh, that word was up 700% year over year. Furlough, that was up over 4,000% year over year. Uh, challenging was up uh, 70% year over year. Uh, but can you guess the one word that was used more than any other year, year over year? It was up 70,000% and it appeared almost on every phone call. And it was the word unprecedented. How many of you heard that on a news, maybe a, a news channel? You've heard that. Maybe you used that word. In fact, 2020 uh, uh, Webster Dictionary chose unprecedented as the word of the year. And we look at last year, and of course, a lot of uncertainties last year, and these conference calls were of uh, economic nature primarily, but it certainly was un, an unprecedented year. But I believe for us right now, we stand at a place that is also unprecedented spiritually. The attacks that Satan is launching against our youth, uh, against uh, Christianity. I joke about the word of the year, unprecedented. A couple years ago, the word of the year was post-truth. Uh, the year before, uh, unprecedented 2019, the word was non-binary. Uh, we're living in different times, certainly. And although to us we may see like this is unprecedented, one of the things I want to make clear right off the bat was that God has not changed. I love studying the book of Joshua because it begins, in fact, you can turn there to Joshua chapter number one. Now, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant is dead. So what are we going to do about that? And the next phrase says, now, therefore, rise. You see, there's a new leader. In fact, the book of Joshua begins with the death of a leader and it ends with the death of a leader. But it's the same God. It's the same promises. And it's the same God that we worship today and the same promises that we claim. Some might say that this is a watershed moment for us in our nation, uh, spiritually. 
The Continental Divide is, is uh, or the Great Continental Divide is the mountain range in Western North America. Uh, it runs north to south and it separates the flow of water on our, confident, on our continent. On the eastern side, all water, a raindrop that falls to the, to the eastern side of the Continental Divide will eventually make its way out to the Atlantic or to the Gulf. Uh, a, a raindrop that falls on the western side eventually is going to make its way out to the Pacific Ocean. This is a, called a watershed. It's a watershed. It's a geological term. And it may not seem like a big deal. It may just fall a few feet on one side or the other of the Continental Divide. But the implications of where that raindrop falls has massive implications. In fact, that's why we have this idiom. And maybe you've heard it before. Maybe you've used it. The, the idiom watershed moment. A watershed moment is a turning point, the exact moment that changes the direction of an activity or a situation. A watershed moment is a dividing point from which things will never be the same. It is considered monumentous, though a watershed moment is not often recognized in hindsight. And we just celebrated the 35th anniversary of our church. God has been so good to us, but, but I believe in many ways we're standing in a watershed moment. I believe we're standing in a moment where uh, the implications of what we do uh, for Christ in the next uh, year, in the next few years, and I believe that the decisions, I told this to the teens, the decisions they make at teen camp, it may not seem like a big deal. They may get home and things might feel like normal, but I believe many of those decisions were watershed decisions where the implications of those decisions are not seen for years. And so here we find the children of Israel, Israel, they're at a watershed moment. If you understand the history of the children of Israel, they had just spent 40 years wandering. An entire generation had essentially died off. And this was, God's promise was still valid. It was the same God, same promise. But this was a, a new generation. There's definitely some generational implications in this passage. This is a new generation. This is their opportunity to put their faith to the test, to prove God. This was a critical moment of transition. Here they were going to go from wandering to conquering. They were going to enter into that promised land. This was also a period of unprecedented vulnerability. They're about to cross the Jordan River. We'll talk about what the Jordan River looked like historically at that time. But this is a, this is a point where even from a military perspective, they were vulnerable. And so this was going to take courage to go. And this was, this was their generation's defining moment. But there was a promise, and Joshua is reminded by God, and if you read through Joshua 3 and Joshua chapter 4, there's a lot of repetition, because what we find here is God telling Joshua, Joshua telling the people, and we find it repeated again throughout these passages. But, but, the, but the promise is there, that the Lord will do wonders among you. And I believe that we still serve a miracle-working God. I still believe that we serve a God that's in control and a God that wants to do miracles among us, to do wonders among us. I believe we serve a God that wants to see uh, teenagers to grow up and be pure and live for Him and, and have families uh, like, like, uh, as, as defined by Scripture. I believe that's the God that we serve. And I believe God will continue to do wonders among us. This was a giant test of obedience where they obey God's Instruction. This is a giant test of faith for this, for this generation. Would they cower in fear or would they cross the Jordan River with boldness? As soon as they cross the Jordan River, they're in enemy territory. There, will, there would be battles that would be fought. They're less than six miles away from Jericho. In fact, uh, Jericho, the inhabitants of Jericho, they know what's going on. They, they're aware of who's there. And this is a, a watershed moment, a defining moment. The Bible tells us in verse number 15 of this passage, the river was flooding. The Jordan River overfloweth in all its banks at time of harvest. The point of their crossing was, as I mentioned, less than five miles away from the city walls of Jericho. And verse number 16 says, and the people passed right over against Jericho. Well, how many people were crossing? And this is a picture of the Jordan River. If you have, if you have the opportunity to visit the, the Holy Land, like I know you have, uh, Brother Hauk, many times, you, you look at the Jordan River and there's some parts of the Jordan River that are kind of deep and wide like this. And there are other parts that are very unimpressive, right? There are parts of the Jordan River that you think, you look at it and you're like, I, I could jump through to that, you know? If you have a map in the back of your, in the back of your Bible, you can see a map during the, uh, the conquest of Canaan. And then you, you see the, the Dead Sea, you see the Sea of Galilee, and the Jordan River flows all the way up. There's a few interesting things about the Jordan River. One is that the entire Jordan River is below sea level. 
uh, the way that the, the, the tectonic plates are situated in, in uh, the, the valley, they form kind of the Jordan Valley, the Jordan River, it's very low. There's a little body of water that's no longer there. And so the water has changed throughout the years. One of the reasons is the population has grown and farmers are pulling from uh, the, 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 the water. And so there's, a, there's different reasons uh, why the, the Jordan River doesn't look the same. But at the time, scripture is clear that this is, this is a large river and it overflowed. And this was, this was a big deal. This is a big moment for them to cross. It was much deeper, much wider than at that time. Well, how many people are we talking about? Well, we know in Numbers chapter number 26 that there were numbered of the children of Israel, 600,000 uh, soldiers. So that, that could be, you could very easily come up with a number of 1.5 million. If you would think, if there's 600,000 soldiers, just, just think of the, the, the women and the children. It's easily between 1.5 and, and 2 million people. And so what will it take for them to move forward in this watershed moment? What will it take for us? We're at, we, we, hear the, we hear the calls, we're living in unprecedented times, and I'm, I'm so thankful that we have the same God. Well, how can we move forward in faith during this moment? How can we lead our families? How can we lead a future generations? Well, it's going to take a few things, and we find them here in Scripture. What was it going to take for the children of Israel to cross? First of all, it was going to take clear vision. Clear vision. Clear vision is what enables us to see God's leading. In verse number three, we read, and they commanded the people, saying, When ye see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priest bearing it. I underlined here in scripture, when you see. There was a priority here that everyone had to be able to see the ark of the covenant. In fact, in verse number four, there shall be a space between you and it, about uh, 2,000 cubits by measure, which come not near unto it, come not near unto it, that ye may go, know the way by which ye must go. So for just very practically, when you have that many people there, if everyone crowds up close to it, it's hard for everyone to see. And there's a priority here in scripture from God to Joshua, to the people, that everyone needed to be able to see, or see clearly the Ark of the Covenant. They needed to be focused on the leading of God. The Ark was the visible representation of the presence of God. And lest you think this is not important, it was mentioned 17 times in these passages that they, that they see the Ark of the Covenant, that they see. So what is so important about this Ark? It is important because it symbolized God's presence among his people. If you know, I think we have a, a little drawing here of the tabernacle and just, um, I know we have other people here, Brother England, Brother Hawk, you guys are experts in the, in the tabernacle. Well, here's, here's the tabernacle and you, you enter through the east gate and there's a, the brazen altar um, and, and, and then you enter into the tabernacle itself and uh, the tabernacle is about uh, 15 feet wide, 45 feet deep. And when you enter, there's the table of showbread, there's this golden menorah, the altar of incense. And then, of course, there's the, whole, there, there, there's the holy place here, and then there's the holy of holies. The holy of holies is about 15 by 15 by 15. And this is where the high priest could enter once a year on the Day of Atonement to enter into the manifest presence of God here in this place. And there's one piece of furniture here, and that was the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was about three feet, nine inches long, two feet, three inches wide, and, uh, and about two feet uh, high or so. It was covered with gold both inside and out. The, the lid was pure gold. There were two figures, two uh, uh, angels facing each other on either end. The, the, the wings were stretched out and upward, nearly meeting directly above the cover. It was then that space above the lid between the wings of the angels that God was symbolically understood to dwell and, and, and this, is, this is what God told him in Exodus chapter number 25. He said, there I will meet with thee and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat between the two cherubims, uh, which are upon the ark and the testimony of all things will I give thee and the commandment unto the children of Israel. And so the ark of the covenant, it was a, it was a big deal. In fact, the sons of, of Aaron would be, uh, it would be their responsibility to help carry the tabernacle. So one family would, would take up all the cloths of the tabernacles, the skins, uh, the, 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 the cloths, the curtains that, that would made up the tabernacle. Another son would take all the poles, all the structure itself. And then another family would take literally the ark itself. As the ark would be moved, it was, it was most likely, it was covered in this time because it was, it was the presence of God. And, 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 and in the ark of the covenant, we see some things. We see uh, the holiness of God with the box were given, inside the box were the stone tablets of the law that had been given to Moses. 
Those tablets were broken. A good reminder uh, that breaking God's law is an assault on God. We see the holiness of God, the, the holy place. We see the justice of God. It was in the space above the lid of the ark where I mentioned that God was uh, symbolically understood to dwell. And, and, and the whole ark is a, is a picture of justice. In fact, there was one a point, if you remember, that Aaron and Miriam and Moses were, were brought in and there was, there was justice was executed there. And the ark is a picture of justice. Uh, but, the, but the ark is also a picture of mercy because it was on the mercy seat once a year that the high priest would come in and, and, uh, and, and, and sprinkle the blood that was shed for the people as, as an offering of atonement. In fact, uh, the, the, the word uh, for the Ark of the Covenant in the New Testament, if I understand it correctly, is, is the propitiation. So literally, Jesus became our mercy seat. He became our propitiation. And so the lid was made of, uh, of gold and the blood would be sprinkled on the lid. The, the lid, tradition tells us the high priest would go in with a rope tied around his ankle in case uh, there in that moment in the presence of God, uh, he was struck dead because of a sin that was in his life. And so Romans 3.25 tells us that Christ was our propitiation. We see, the, we see the Ark of the Covenant. And this is why it's such a big deal. It wasn't just a piece of furniture. It was the presence of God. It was the presence of God with them. And so if they were going to go forward, if they were going to move from wandering to conquering, they had to keep their eyes focused on God, focused on the leading. If God led, but they refused to follow, they'd, they'd have problems like the previous generation. Or if they tried to advance when God was not leading, how many have ever done that? We'll also have problems. Well, how does, the, how, does the, how does God lead us today? He leads us by his word and through his spirit. John 16, 13. So in this watershed moment, what, what does God tell them? You got to see me and you got to see me clearly. And that meant that they, that, that they need to free themselves from any distraction. The Bible says when you see the ark of the, of the, uh, of the covenant, and the priest of Levi is bearing it. Then you shall remove yourself from your place and go after it. Whatever you are doing, put it down. Put it down and go after the ark. See, God deserves our complete attention. We live in such a distracted world, don't we? Our attention spans get shorter and shorter. Have you ever talked to somebody and as you're talking with that person, they're talking and they're nodding and then they're pulling out their phone and they're looking and they're nodding and you're like, I'm just going to go. I, you're not even listening. We've all been there before, right? Maybe, maybe you were the guilty party. We live in a distracted uh, world. We're constantly distracted. Our attention is pulled in every, sense, every direction. But if we're going to see God do something wonderful in this watershed moment, we have to keep our eyes clearly focused on him. A few years back, we took our family to Disneyland. This was, this was the great days, if you remember it, before masks and social distancing and things like that. I had a picture here of my daughter, Layton, and we, we, we heard that the, that the, uh, the parade was coming. I, 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 I see families sometimes where they park on the curb and they'll wait all day for the parade. I just think that's ridiculous. I don't have that much patience, right? So what we try to do is we try to finagle our way in, you know, some spot to see, see the parade. We didn't really plan all that well, but the parade was coming and she saw Elsa on, on, on one of these floats and she was she, 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 she was so excited to see Elsa. She started calling out to, to Elsa's name, but she's too small. She couldn't see. So what I did is I lifted her up and I wanted her to get a clear look. And in scripture, we find here when God says uh, to the children of Israel how important it is for them to be able to see. This is the point here that, that they needed to be able to see God leading for themselves. I think of even the generational impact. Parents, we need to make sure that our kids, like I lift up my daughter late, and we need to make sure that they see Christ. They should see Christ in our home. They should see Christ uh, in our living, in our decisions, in our devotions, in our love for our spouse and our family, in the way that we uh, uh, share the gospel with others. Uh, are, are you lifting up Christ in your family? Are you helping? Listen, sometimes that means eliminating a distraction. I know sometimes with, with teenagers, they, they're not seeing Christ because of something stupid like this. Or maybe a relationship that's not good for them. And sometimes it takes a loving parent to come in and say, hey, give that to me. Or here's why we're going to put an end to this relationship, because we want to help others see Christ. Uh, maybe you're in here and you're a, a bit older and your children have moved out. You know, you can still help a younger generation to see Christ. You can tell them of, of the past of victories that we've experienced and what you've experienced and point them to Christ. So they need to be free from any, 
any obstruction. I, I think of uh, even our high school students when they, this critical moment between high school and college. I, I think sometimes uh, a job is a good thing, right? We're supposed to be able to work and provide, right? But I think even sometimes a good thing be can become a distraction. When, when you're working so much that you're never in church and you're never seeing God, that's problematic. And one of the things we need to do as a church family is we need to make sure that we're all, we're looking Christ, looking for Christ and we're seeing him clearly. So if we're going to see God do wonders in our midst, we have to see him clearly. We have to spend time in his word. We have to spend time studying his word. So what is it going to take? It's going to take, first of all, clear vision, but it's also going to take complete trust. Look at verse number four. That ye may know the way by which ye must go, for ye have not passed this way heretofore. Have you ever gone somewhere before where you, uh, you've never been and so you were, you were very cautious, you were very keen on instructions? I remember a few years ago, uh, I was meeting my dad up in Canada and I flew in and my, my cell service didn't work and so I was given a set of instructions. It was written, handwritten on a piece of paper by who knows who and it was scanned and given to me and the paper, the instructions literally, it wasn't turned left on this road, right on this road. It, it literally said, when you see the, the red tractor in the field, keep going. And when you see the gas station with the broken pump, then you go here. And it was like the whole page was like that. And I was paying close attention. Why? I'd, I'd never been there before. You know, a life of faith, by definition, takes us into the unknown. That's the exciting thing about living for, for Christ is that when you are sensitive to his spirit, when you're, when you're in his word, it's going to take you places where you haven't been before. And this is what uh, Joshua, God is telling Joshua to tell the people, listen, you need to pay close attention. You need to make sure that you can see God clearly for yourself. Why? Because you haven't been this way before. I think this is another good reminder for uh, high school students and young adults in our church that, listen, uh, you haven't figured it all out, right? You, 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 if you're in high school, you haven't made uh, college decisions yet. If you're in college, you haven't made ma uh, marriage decisions yet. And I think that understanding will keep us humble before the Lord that, hey, we haven't been this way before. Pursuing God's will often requires that we follow him through unfamiliar territory. You know, uh, sometimes what we do in unfamiliar territory is we, we just like to take control, right? We, we, we think, have you ever been lost with someone? And if you're not the one driving, you can be very opinionated about it. You should have turned back there, you know, but you would have probably gotten lost too. It's easier for us to do. And sometimes what we assume is when we take control of our life's direction, that that's going to guarantee a satisfactory result. Nothing's further from the truth. You see, the children of Israel, they did it their way for 40 years. And they wandered and they wandered and they wandered. And here God comes to them and says, I'm going to do something great, but you have to follow my lead because you've never been here before. Listen, God, we have a great history here at Lancaster Baptist Church. God has done some amazing things and we often look back and we should, but I don't know what the next 20, 35 years is going to look like. Why? Because we haven't been there before. I don't know what the challenges are going to be and I don't know what the blessings are, are going to be, but that's why as a church family, we need to stay close to him and focus on his leading and trusting him every step of the way. So it takes uh, uh, trust. It also takes a clean heart. Look at verse number five. What's it going to take for us to see God do some wonders in our midst? It's going to take a clean heart. Verse number five, and Joshua said to the people, sanctify yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Here's the idea here. Don't get used to sin. I love the emphasis here, first of all, on yourselves. This is something that you have to do personally sanctify, purify yourselves. Now, for the, for the Jewish individuals, they knew exactly what this meant because this is not the first time they did it. When Paul, or when, uh, when Joshua tells them to sanctify themselves, it meant literally they needed to go take a bath, they needed to change clothes, they needed to clean themselves. Ceremonial, they needed to be clean. And so that's what it meant. Uh, God was going to do something awesome, but first they had to make sure that their hearts were pure. You alone are responsible for your purity sanctify yourselves. And then it says, for tomorrow. Purity today results in blessings tomorrow. And this is why it's such a big deal, especially for younger generations, that we, that we help them to, to guard their heart, to guard their minds, 
to teach them what's right and what's wrong and when we should turn something off and help them to understand those things because uh, every, every, every single one of us is responsible for purity. Our, our, our pur- purify yourselves, sanctify yourselves for tomorrow. I think of the extent of our, our purity. And sometimes we think of purity as being just this idea for the younger individuals of our church. Can I tell you that's for every single Christian in here today? This idea of being pure. I'm talking about mental purity, the things we think about. Philippians 4.8 gives us instructions on that. I, I think about emotional purity, uh, not giving ourselves to, 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 to someone else or, uh, uh, or, or, or giving ourselves away, especially I'm thinking of a, a dating relationship. I'm thinking of physical purity uh, just, and, and just the practical purity, not setting any wicked thing before our eyes. And so purity to today results in blessings tomorrow. And Joshua said in the children, verse nine, come hither and hear the words of the Lord, your God. The Bible tells us if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Second Corinthians 13, five, examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith, prove your own selves. So here's this idea of just examining your heart, trying my heart. Listen, the Bible tells us that we don't have good hearts that we need to try to keep from becoming bad. What the Bible teaches us is that we have wicked hearts that can only be changed by the grace of God. And here's this idea of, of confessing sin. And even Jesus, when he was teaching his disciples to pray, uh, uh, taught them uh, to forgive. And, and sometimes for a new believer, that's confusing because we think, well, didn't I already get forgiveness for all my sins, past, present, future? Yes, absolutely. Positionally, right? You've taken care of that. But for matters of fellowship, we are taught in Scripture to confess our sins and to confess our faults. Um, and so uh, we need to make sure that we examine our hearts and practice this idea of, of purity, to sanctify yourselves, to be ready. How do you approach God? I, I, there's, they were told the distance, and I think there's two reasons. The first was it's here in Scripture that they were told the distance uh, themselves from the Ark of the Covenant so that way they could see the Ark no matter where they were, and then they could go after that. But one of the other reasons I believe the Ark was, was so in front of the people was because of the, the nature of God. Uh, see, we're not to approach God flippantly. We, we look at these examples in the Old Testament. I show you the picture of the tabernacle and we see that worship in the Old Testament always took place at arm's length. If you wanted to experience the presence of God, well, a few things had to happen. First of all, you had to be a male. You had to be of the right tribe. Uh, you had to be a priest. Then you had to be a high priest. And then once a year you could go in and you can experience the presence of God like that. Well, Hebrews tells us that now we can come boldly. And we should come boldly, but we shouldn't come flippantly. And this is the idea of sanctifying ourselves. Listen, even as we come into a setting like this, and we have conversations and we see people in the parking lot and we cut up before and after. But listen, we should also come with a holy reverence, a fear for God. You know, when you get saved, there's a, there's a fear that departs and there's a fear that comes. The fear that departs should be the, the anxiety, the worry, all those little things in life. Those are the fears that when we accept Christ and enjoy that relationship, those fears go away. But another fear comes, and that is the fear of the Lord. That's what, uh, when, we, when we sing Amazing Grace, we, we hear the, the, the phrase, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear." And grace, my fears relieved. See, there were some fears that were, that were new and there were some fears that, that went away. And for us as believers, when we, when we approach God, we should approach him with a holy reverence. There should be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Come not near unto it, that ye may know the way by which to go. And so as we come to God, we should, we should come, yes, with boldness, but not flippantly, understanding who he is and a holy reverence for our God. I was talking to uh, Fred Conrad this morning. He was telling me how they took a trip up to Yosemite this week, a one day trip, 15 hours of driving there and back. I'm amazed sometimes I talk to people who live in California and for all the bad things we can grumble about California, there's some beautiful things to see in California. And one of them is Yosemite Valley. If you've never gotten the chance, you should go there to Yosemite Valley. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. Well, the first time I ever went to Yosemite Valley, we entered through the, the tunnel view. And how many of you have been through the tunnel view into Yosemite Valley? And this is a, this is a picture during uh, the winter. It's beautiful. And then there's another picture just outside. This is when you come into Yosemite Valley. You can, this is taken from a parking lot. So literally you can go and you can, you can, you can see. It's, it's just one of these amazing places where we can observe God's creation on earth. 
Uh, but I remember being my first couple times to Yosemite. I, I entered through this and we pulled over and parked and we took some pictures. I remember a couple years ago, I told my wife, I'd like to take our kids to Yosemite. But we went the back way. We went up to 395, up to, I believe, 120 through Lee Vining. And that was a beautiful drive as well. But it wasn't tunnel view when you ent- entered into the park. And I remember not really knowing where we were. And we've been driving for some time. And um, I'm talking with Ashley. And oh, I, I said, I think we're going to be there any time now. It feels like we're getting closer. You enter the park. How many of you guys have been through the back way into Yosemite? So you enter into the back way. But then you drive for a while. And so we drove for a while. And, and all of a sudden, there, there it was. There was El Capitan. There was Yosemite Falls. And it was all there. And it was beautiful. But it was, then it was gone. I'm like, hey, Ashley, there it is. You know? And she like, looked up and it was gone. And we missed it because we weren't ready for it. And I've been telling her this whole time, like, when you enter the valley, it's going to be epic, you know. Well, if you come around the back way, it's, it, it is awesome, uh, but it's not quite tunnel view. And we weren't prepared for it, and we missed out on it. Could it be that you haven't seen the grandeur and, and greatness of God and his majesty because you weren't prepared for it? You ever wonder how two people can come into the same service, and one can be deeply touched, and another can be looking at their watch, just kind of ready to go? I think a lot of times the difference is who is prepared to hear and receive. So it's going to take, it's going to take us uh, seeing God. It's going to take us trusting God. It's going to take a clean heart. But finally, it's going to take committed action. We read, And the priests that bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood, stood firm on dry ground in the midst of Jordan, verse number 17. And the Israelites passed over on dry ground until all the people passed clean over. In the verse we read earlier, we read the phrase, to go after it. I I believe many people practice some form of a passive faith. And their idea of faith is this. God, I'm I'm here. Uh, I'm here if you need me. Let me know. I'm just right here. Uh, I I was reading uh, a a few weeks ago, C.H. Spurgeon said something to the effect of that God's promises are not a couch to sit upon. We got to go after it. We got to claim it. Uh, In fact, this was the promised land, right? It was their land. But they had to get up and go after it. If you're going to see God do something awesome in our midst, it's going to take us acting and acting in faith. Real faith is not just believing in spite of the evidence. It is obeying in spite of the consequences. The children of Israel, they had passed through a body of water before, the Red Sea. But when they passed through the Red Sea, God worked that situation out differently, didn't he? Moses held out the staff and the the water parted. And even if you were a skeptic, you could stand on on kind of the banks and be like, oh, wow, that's neat. I'll go. But this time it was a little different. This time it says, I want you to start crossing before the waters part. And they did. And they crossed. And it came uh, to pass after the people removed their tents to to pass over Jordan. The priests bearing the ark were come to Jordan. And the feet of the priests that bear the ark were dipped into the brim of the water. For the Jordan overflowed all his banks at the time of the harvest. And the waters which came up from above stood up and rose up upon a heap. By the way, there's a lot of people that try to explain things like this in Scripture. In fact, there was two different times in history. One was in, uh, uh, in 1200 and one was in the 1900s where the Jordan River stopped. And they, they were stopped because of uh, earthquake activity. For, for almost an hour, uh, even, even about 100 years ago, the Jordan River stopped and it's flowing. So, so some people tried to explain uh, explain, well, it was just, it was an earthquake. But listen, the Bible says they, they passed over in drier ground. I don't know why some people have the need to try to explain these things, man. If you can get past Genesis chapter number one, the first verse that God created, I mean, it's all kind of downhill from there, right? But there's all these different ideas. All I know is, and, and, and wouldn't that be amazing if that's what, how God worked through an earthquake? Isn't that amazing, his timing, that as soon as they stepped, an earthquake happened? I don't think that's how it happened. But, but nonetheless, God moved and God did something great in their midst. And the waters which came down stood uh, uh, from above, stood up and rose up upon a heap from the very city of Adam beside Zaratan. And those that came down towards the sea of the plain, even the salt sea, failed and were uh, cut off. And the people passed right over against Jericho. And the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of Jordan. And all the Israelites passed over on dry ground until all the people uh, were clean over. And they kept looking and they kept walking. They kept their eyes focused on the presence of God and they kept moving. If 2,000 people could cross a minute, it would take about eight hours for a million people to cross. That's a lot of people. 
and they kept walking and they kept moving. And they were able to see 40 years after when a generation had had kind of squandered an opportunity to claim the promises of God. Now, 40 years later, they're entering and and they weren't perfect. They make mistakes along the way. You continue reading uh, throughout the book of Joshua. But God, it's amazing that how God can use a leader and a people that are on the same page and that believe and trust the promises of God. And that's that's what happens here. And they pass over on dry ground. The same God, the same promises, they move forward. And yes, even in that moment, it was, it was unprecedented. But God was sovereign and always in control. And so, although we don't always know what tomorrow is going to be like, and the next day and the next day, we know who's in control. And we've got clear marching orders. We need to keep our eyes focused on him, uh, focused on his presence. We need to make sure that our hearts are clean and purified. Uh, We need to uh, uh, completely trust him, understanding that we haven't always been this way before. And then finally, step forward in committed action. Not this passive faith, but God used me to do something great. Help me to act in bold faith. We read of Abraham, and Abraham's a good picture of faith. It says he went out not knowing whithersoever he went. He just went out and God led him by faith every step of the way. And I think he'll do the same thing for us individually and collectively as a church.